Hey everybody, this is Jason Jeffries for the Alliance Project. I got Joseph Reyna here. He's an author of the book Incredulous and I believe another book. Um, what was it, Joseph? Well, the next one's coming out and uh, I'm going to, I really want to name it something else, but it's probably going to be Dragon Slayer and it's in reference to the conquering of the reptilians, I suppose. Oh, I have not released it. Oh, you're not, you haven't released. That's right. I was talking to you. I didn't remember if you had it released yet or not, but uh, very interested in everything you've had to say and uh, people have been just asking to have you back. So here you are. <laughs> so uh, thank you. What do you got for us tonight, Joseph? I've reviewed some of the stuff you were you just released, dealing with future prophecies. And this Planet X thing, it's, it's all over the Bible. It's called the Son of Righteousness by Jeremiah, S-U-N, like the sun in the sky. But people interpret it as Christ, the Son of Righteousness. And that's not what he was talking about at all. The... The event that's coming, what they call the ascension, from the best research I've been able to do, appears that the human beings will become light bodies. And there's a specific method for this. It's a lot like the Star Trek movie about the Nexus, where you have to be on the surface of the planet, it hits you, you have no fear, and you're, you're there basically in the higher dimension. I thought that was interesting because it's exactly what it looks like. You were mentioning the Hopi prophecy. Have you looked into the Hopi prophecy rock much? Yeah, I've seen the, the prophecy rock where it has the, the reverse swastika and like the symbol of the cross of Christ and things like that. Is that the one you're referring to? Is a carving? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've looked into it. I haven't um, really made any opinions on it. I just heard what the elders were saying about it when they were explaining the rock and things like that. Well, the guy who was supposed to interpret it was Thomas Bianca. And he was basically selected from, by a Hopi elder and told, go out there and find these prophecies that were supposed to release to basically the world because the Gord of Ashes had just been dropped. That was um, an atomic bomb they detonated early in the morning close to them. And Bianca did a very good job of interpreting it. He described the people on the top row, the, you spoke of the five ages of man. There's four there. And the fifth one, if you look carefully, that last person with the arm out, he's actually holding onto someone's arm, someone climbing up that jagged zigzag line at the end. Well, that's the timeline. That line going across, that's an actual timeline. So it's basically jumping up in harmonics and densities, so different dimensions, I guess. And he's just holding onto that person, but he's already like vanished. He's gone. Yeah. Bianca saw that as a destruction of man from his interpretation. And then you've got a line going straight down from that individual to another line at the bottom. And that line, interestingly enough, hits the edge of the rock and continues back around the rock. So that timeline goes a long way. Timeline above ends, goes into the, another dimension, the one on the bottom keeps going. So he interpreted that as the, um, I guess, the people of the earth who get closer to nature because there's a plant there. Only that individual down there looks really bad. He, the guys up on top, they look a little overweight, a little bit happy. The guy in the bottom does not look happy. It, his body is just one long squiggly line, like a, almost a question mark on his side. He's got an arm coming out about where a tail would come out for a monkey holding a cane. He's got the other arm up much higher. And the legs are very small. It just doesn't look right. Anyway, I had a, a vision that went over that, and it was because I had gotten an Indara crystal. And it was just a really, really strange situation. I didn't know what to make of it. I was just trying to write as fast as I could before I would forget. But they showed me that that interpretation is not the correct interpretation. So I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. They said that uh, that, that division, that line going straight up and down, that's a breakaway between all the human races. They became two separate races at that point. One race ascended up into, um, I guess, fifth dimension. Yeah. whatever dimension we're going to the bottom line however that's a cave that little half circle there bianca said those are three world wars or actually first two world wars first two circles those were man-made the third one the third shaking he called it would not be of our doing it would be an external effect but that is not a circle it's a d 
laying on its side. So it's like the entrance of a cave. To me, those are the underground bunkers is what I was shown because they went down underground and they tried to survive, but they couldn't because you don't do well outside of the sun. Yeah. And that, that shows a division in the species of humanity. In order to, to reconnect this with the work I was doing, I had to go to Dolores Cannon. She was speaking about the three ways of volunteers who came in. Now, the apocalypse, we've all studied the apocalypse. I'm sure we've read it. We've read other authors on the subject. The thing is that all my work shows that the apocalypse should have happened, should have started about 2006, ended toward the end of um, 2012 into 2013. All the timing's perfect for it. Right at the end of 2013, it has the year 5772, which is part of 2013, the end of 2012. And it says Earth annihilated, and it's got a comet there. So Earth should have been annihilated by a comet. That, to me, is Comet Ison, which was dismantled and was not allowed to annihilate us, I suppose. Anyway, the, um, the thing with the guys on the bottom, the little bodies on the bottom of the Hopi prophecy, we're still dealing with the Hopi prophecy here. Yeah. There was another link to these guys, and that was with um, the visitations in the desert, President Eisenhower, when he went out there and met with the different off-world groups that wanted to share information and they wanted to abduct people, things like that. Well, there was a type of gray there, and they said that they were originally human from Earth, but they had been trapped in underground bunkers during a tremendous catastrophe and uh, they didn't go into details about the catastrophe but it was coming in the near future they said around 2012 and then they couldn't reproduce once they were underground they were trapped these bunkers go down about four miles from what i understand so they were trapped and couldn't get out females couldn't reproduce and they had to use cloning technology the government later reproduced some of these experiments with women underground and after 45 days their system shut down for mm. reproduction mm. so the timeline continues around the rock goes around the back. These guys said they came back from the future. They had finally escaped from underground. When they got to the surface, they were horribly deranged by the radiation levels that were present here in the United States. Most of that, I don't think it was from any great World War III. It was probably from all the spent fuel rods and the uh, nuclear plants we have all over the country. So if those would have shut down, power would have gone out they would have eventually started decaying and, and evaporating the water and just releasing radiation. And they said they were then assisted by another race who came to Earth, picked them up, took them out of here. And they came from the future. They came from our future. And they wanted to abduct their parents, their um, descendants, or the ones who, yeah, I guess they're descendants, from the Earth and repair their DNA, the damage that they had from their DNA. So the government went ahead and went with them. And the people they abducted, they weren't supposed to abduct more than 400, and they were supposed to give the information, addresses, names. They didn't do any of that. They abducted far more people. And these individuals changed the mentality of the people they abducted. The ones that were abducted sort of became more spiritual, um, didn't fit in anymore, questioned too much. And they didn't go down into the underground bunkers, and some of them did not meet their mates. So these future beings cease to exist because they managed to prevent their parents from ever getting together or their grandparents. Yeah. That I, would, I believe would be permitted because it's sort of a self-sacrifice so that they wouldn't have to endure what was about to happen. We're on a different timeline now. That's evidenced by the Mandela effect. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of that. We were talking about it a while back. Yes. The, um, Mandela effect is really fascinating when you start getting into the word matrix that now appears in the Bible because the matrix apparently should have been there all along that word. Uh, Sophia Stewart, she's the author of the matrix. She explained to me that the female reproductive system creates like a stargate ma matrix. It then links with the child that's going to be born, the soul that still has no body. And it causes the body that's being created, the DNA, to resonate to the soul. That's most of the junk DNA. So it resonates with you so that when the child is born, you are aware as that child, kind of like an avatar. So that's what the matrix is. And 
I just find it fascinating that that word started showing up because it was not in the Bible before. It simply wasn't there. It is there now six times. Yes. This um, timeline shift. Oh, go ahead. Did you want to say something? I was just saying that that's that's interesting. You say that because um, I, I follow the work of Drew below Melchizedek and things like that, and he seems to think that um, this timeline thing has to do with you know uh, Earth almost manifesting the the same like almost going into the phasing into the fourth dimension, but picking up everything as it was in the third dimension to kind of help us along in this ascension process since we didn't make it essentially. Um, it's pretty wild stuff, but it's, uh, it goes like right along with this. And I, I was, was not aware of the matrix appearing in the Bible. So I just wanted to make note of that for other people. Um, a lot of them like the Mandela effect and stuff like that. So just found that intriguing. Um, sorry to interrupt you there. You were talking about the matrix. Oh, no problem. Yeah. It's where, the, where it says womb. It now sometimes says matrix. Wow. I, and a lot of people have dreams and visions of disaster. I'm getting text on that, about the dreams and the visions of disaster. And you have these dreams and visions because in the Mandela effect, we went through those, those disasters. But in this timeline, we're not going to experience those disasters. Those of us who remember that line, the lion shall lay with the lamb, can go into a Christian store and buy a poster that shows a lion laying next to a lamb. The thing is, it's quoting... The same verse, Isaiah 11, 6, only it says, and the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. So it makes no sense why there's not a picture of a wolf up there. Yeah. It's because we remember something that originally said um, something quite different. Mm -hmm. Anyway, these, these disasters, I believe, happen in the other timeline. So uh, we would remember them and we would have dreams of them. One person who heard me asked about the shockwave that's coming because I had mentioned that. And Wilcock is also talking about a wave, a shock wave coming from the sun. If you follow the work of Jay Wiedner, he has a DVD he created, quite a few, but this one's called The Secrets of Alchemy. And in that one, he gives quite a few interviews on the internet over it. The Secrets of Alchemy, he broke the code on a cross, a very old cross called the Cross of Hende. And the code basically stated that we were going to get hit with the galactic shock wave. This galactic shock wave would bring so much dust into the, into the solar system that the sun would sort of be blanketed. And then the sun would fire a second shock wave. That's the shock wave Wilcock is talking about, the shock wave from the sun. That's the destructive shock wave. The first shock wave is an energy very high frequency shock wave that literally transmutes anything it strikes. It converts it to a much higher frequency, a much more pure element, basically lead to gold. And that shock wave will be visible. It's not going to be a surprise. You're going to see it in the Southern Hemisphere, right where Sagittarius points his bow, right where Scorpio brings up his stinger between those two. It will appear blue, very, very blue. The Hopi say it's got nine points, the nine-pointed star of creation. So it's Kwasahu. And that particular field of energy, once it strikes you, it's uh, basically going to alter whatever's there. If, if someone's evil, if they're, I mean, inherently just incredibly selfish, this energy, they can't rise. They can't raise their frequency fast enough. It'll basically uh, undo them. The ones who have no fear and... Uh, are selfless try and help others those it will not be a problem for them there'll be a simple transition so this also goes along with Gaia waking up we were talking about the possibility that earth is only 12,000 years old because most of the evidence points to that a remnant of Tiamat that would mean Gaia is a, is a brand new type of planet and she's waking up and of course the powers the dark powers that run the world would like to keep her i guess unconscious because it's a it's a living force and it's a feminine force and they like to subdue feminine energy so when she awakens she's going to have a brand new species on her that's never been seen before either in the galaxy we there's no other species like us in the galaxy and uh, that's that's part of what's happening right now she's waking up i don't know the energy that we're coming into is waking her up you remember the Schumann resonance was supposed to start rising. It had been rising back before 2012. Yes. And uh, Greg Braden covered a lot of this. 
the frequency had gone up to 13. And I thought, wow, that's really high. And it, I found it interesting that that's one of the, one of the prime numbers, the Fibonacci sequence. You've got one and one. One plus one is two. Then you have one plus two is three. Then three plus five is eight. Um, I didn't say two plus three. Two plus three is five. Three plus five is eight. And it was hovering right at about the eight. So when five and eight were added, it became 13. That was 2012. It was at 13. It's hovering at 30 something right now, jumping up in as high as 36. That's really high. Yeah. So I don't know how much higher it'll get. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I pulled it up right now, a uh, live, live feed of it. And it, it's going right almost just as you say, is like it goes with the Fibonacci. You can see these phases um, where there's this baseline around eight and then, then around 13. And then as you go up, it's around 30 again. And then it, it gets, it, it, it goes right in these stair steps, just like the musical octaves and all of these things. And it's almost like some of us are only, it, it's only like it's a partial awakening almost. Like, you know, like there's still so many of us tuned into this lower frequency. So it's still kind of like the baseline, but the other ones are almost, you know, scattered and all over the place and, you know, five times as much i mean that that's what that's in hertz so that's eight times in a second the standard so 30 times in a second that's a lot more vibration you know that's all that's exactly what all these ancient cultures were talking about i think especially like even with the flat earth when you consider that i believe they were talking about like a lower dimension kind of like hell like a lower frequency and then a higher frequency like heaven like planes of existence so they did it in like a flat representation not necessarily meaning mm -hmm. the world was flat, you know. But uh, sorry to interrupt. You were on the you were talking oh. about human residence and um, how it's jumped up with the Fibonacci spiral and yeah. And earlier on your video, you were talking about the Mayan calendar. The Mayan calendar is set up as like a thirteen by twenty cycles. It always goes thirteen twenty, and I found out that the reason it's thirteen twenty is because we have. Um, 20 digits, fingers and toes, and we have 13 major joints in our body, the neck, the wrist, the elbows, shoulders. That's why they, they went with that. And they said that that calendar ends because what's about to happen is going to be different. And they don't realize, they have no idea how many joints we're going to have exactly or um, how many uh, digits we're going to have. So the calendar has to be different. Yeah. There's an, another calendar by Zion. What was his last name? I'll have to look this guy's name up. He would talk forever on this calendar that was discovered, and I have never spoken on this calendar. He was um, showing that back in the 1930s, a Mayan calendar was found. They picked it up. They weren't sure what it was. And the images on it were brushed on with like a pencil where you put a sheet of paper over it and start brushing on it and take photographs of it. But their language had not been interpreted yet. It wasn't until some linguist got a hold of a codex of one of the, the Mayan codexes and was able to break some of the language. When they found out what that said, it was quite remarkable because in the 1930s, astronomy thought the entire galaxy was the universe. They had no idea we were in a galaxy. They didn't just figure that out till later. And the entire universe was believed to only be um, I think a few hundred thousand years old and then from there it kept getting longer and longer and longer and longer when they found this calendar it stated that the universe was 16.2 um, billion years old hmm. and that was kind of weird and much closer to what they think it is now yeah but it had these cycles of 13 and 20 on the calendar and the cycles counted down they kept counting down in frequency i keep wanting to say zaylon holly but i know that wasn't his name these cycles he showed if you take that number 16.2 billion break it into 13 then you take that 13 and break it into 20 and you'll have um you'll have these stages of time so right around there he says about 2.8 billion years he sees that oh wait a minute i think you break it into 13 sections of 13 and then 20. Anyway, he's, he showed that that's roughly when a planet would start forming or the life on the planet would start forming. Then you break that one down into another set of um, 
stairs, I guess, 20, and you, you take the last one and that gets broken into 13. And that breaks down to a smaller time scale and a smaller time scale and a smaller time scale and a smaller time scale until time just ends. And it ended somewhere on uh, October 28, 2011. The cycle, this spiraling down, down cycle ended at that time. What was fascinating was during the time of nations, what they call time of nations, the, um, the staging was 400 years apart. The main cycles were all 400 years apart. And they said for 400 years, the spoons they used didn't change, the plates they used didn't change, the clothing they used didn't change, the tools they used didn't change, the style of writing, whatever they did, didn't change for 400 years. That's how archaeologists could go back and say, okay, this must have been this period. Yeah. After that entire cycle ended, then the last part was broken down. So you now, got, now you've got 400 something years and you're going to break that down into another uh, stage of smaller cycles. And when you finally get down to 20 years, that was back around the early 19th century. He said for 20 years, you'd be in a relationship. For 20 years, you would hold a job. You know, things pretty much remained the same. People believed what they believed for 20 years, and then it would change. Well, then the next one broke down into one year. So he said, well, that's why you're only going to hold a job for one year, and that's why your relationship is only going to last about a year. And I thought that was quite fascinating because that's kind of what I saw. It's like time was speeding up. So we're in what they call no time now because there's no calendars that cover this period. We've gone beyond the end of when it should have happened, and we've got a lot of assistance for that. The reason they did that was to try and get humanity to become light bodies, as many as possible. The Pleiadians record that an event took place where there were six billion of these light bodies in the future, but they, um, they didn't know where they were coming from. They had to track them down, and they tracked them back to Earth. So an event happened on Earth where roughly six billion of us became light bodies. And what is the light body? It's similar to the rainbow body that, that Wilcock speaks of. These bodies can change form. You can look like anything you want, basically, within reason. And you can, alt you can bilocate. You can be in one location, then project yourself to another location and be there. You can move through doors. You can um, affect objects with your mind. You can eat. You can sit down and have a meal. You're not a ghost. And you're sort of a super Jedi. So what army would be able to stand up to a handful of these guys that would have uh, the powers of Neo in the Matrix? So yeah. Nobody would, really. And I discovered that uh, that's going to be the reptilian's undoing. The reptilian brain, which we were created with, modified and placed into us for control, that brain sits at the base of our brain. And there's ways to get around it. I, I found that out. It was quite fascinating how easily it was, how easy it was to do that. But the reptilian brain is a section of our brain that pretty much remains active when we're in fear mode, when we're in survival, when we are trying to remain in preservation mode. And that's why the leaders of this world keep us in those modes. They keep scarcity of jobs out there, the scarcity of food, scarcity of resources, and always threats of war. So that we're constantly in this cycle. This cycle, our brain um, releases life energy because we're not joyful, we're not happy, we're not excited, and we're stressed out. We basically bleed out all this energy. David Wilcock calls it louche. And louche is a food that these beings feed off of, like vampires. So we're basically feeding them. If we ever stop doing that, they would probably starve to death. But the thing is, if we convert to light bodies, the energy in our bodies, the frequency, the high frequency of love, will beam directly into the reptilians' brains and basically be their undoing. And they're hardwired with this. It's just like we're hardwired with it. So it's quite going to be their undoing. I think that's why they've been trying to sabotage it so much. Something called the RV. I don't know if you're aware of it. It's called the revaluation of currencies. Have you heard of that? No, I haven't heard of that, actually. St. Germain, uh, some time back, centuries back, was able to convert gold in um, from base minerals, mercury or lead. That sounds pretty fantastic. But if you Google 
Mercury to Gold, Japan University, 1938. You'll find that they actually converted mercury to gold, pure gold, using a fusion reactor. And this was in 1938. I believe that's why we have so many fusion reactors right now. They're not really producing a whole lot of power. They're very inefficient. They're basically just heating water for us to turn steam. They're still boiling water to get electricity. Yeah. I think they're using them to create gold from mercury 24-7 because gold is far more valuable in, in these esoteric levels. Well, if you look back at the, the, at the interesting like um, philosopher's legacy and the philosopher's stone and these, um, even the journals of Sir Isaac Newton where they always had these riddles about um, what the philosopher's stone was, what, what, what you could take, what base mineral you could take to turn into gold, you know, the, the alchemers, the, you know, the, the secret, the, you know, the, the key to alchemy, right? The, the holy grail of it. And they always give these riddles to it. And Thoth, you know, uh, however you want to look at it, Hermes, whatever, Mercury rising, his planet was even Mercury. And they, they talk about this so much that it's, it's almost blatant that they were talking about Mercury because they were talking about it being able to be in a liquid form. It's a metal. It can be in the air. It can be a gas. You know, it's talking about, like, um, they're giving a really kind of a riddle aspect to it. But, I mean, when you think of Mercury at room temperature, it's, it's liquid. It's still a metal. It's conductive. It has all these properties that you could kind of trick somebody with a riddle, right? And uh, it's 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 almost blatant and in your face with this occult stuff that Mercury was the philosopher's stone, or however you want to put it. Um, so you right. get into that reactor stuff, man, and you talk about that, and it's blatantly ignorant that they're. I don't think they're making you know, energy out of that either. I, I completely agree that there's a totally different agenda with it. So that's, I've never heard anybody bring that up. So you kind of fascinated me with that. Um, <laughs> so sorry to interject like that. Well, are you familiar? Are you familiar how they take the gold, turn it into a powder, and then can turn it into a glass? Um, orm, what they call orm? Yeah, like a, they put it in like a monoatomic, like a colloidal state, and then they uh, heat it, I guess, and make a glass. Is that what you're talking about? They get it. Right. Floating is like one atom, and then they do it. Yeah, I, I remember seeing that. I wasn't, I, I didn't okay. know. It, but go ahead. That is the Philosopher's Stone. According to several individuals who studied it, that powder, that white powder, is the Philosopher's Stone. If you take that powder, it will feed your soul, basically, make you intuitive, make you more spiritual. But if you're evil, it's like salt on a snail. It, it actually destroys you. Because the frequency is so high. They had trouble patenting the process once they developed it, rediscovered it, rather. When you take gold, let's say we take um, 10 ounces of gold and we convert it into the white powder. The white powder only weighs 5 ounces. Oh, let's go with 9 ounces. 9 ounces of gold and the powder only weighs 5 ounces. They couldn't patent it because of that. And they finally got past it with the research of this physicist who showed that if you could have an element standing in two dimensions at once, five-ninths of its weight would be in one dimension, four-ninths of its weight would be in the other dimension. And they were able to patent it that way because once you move it into glass from the powder, you get the weight back. And the glass is um, completely transparent. In the Bible, it says, the streets of heaven are paved with gold as clear as glass. Hmm. This is what they're talking about. Yeah. I see. That makes total sense because of the, I always heard it was like salt, sulfur, and mercury were like the key three ingredients. And you think of how common those could be. I mean, they're in thermometers. I mean, it's everywhere. So for it to be that, that, that precious and, or that simple, it was, it's really the lesson goes hand in hand, like as above, so below as the, the, the transmutation of the soul or the, the body into the light body is the same as turning like something useless like lead into gold and that's just uh so like i said right the tr transmutation into a higher vibration yeah definitely like the hermetic teachings and things like that i've always loved those teachings but uh sorry to but that's that's how they do it and that's what they were um uh christ in fact when he went on his 40 day cycle 40 day um fast yeah. The pharaohs went on these 40-day fasts. Lawrence Gardner goes into detail on this. He mentions how 
they would go on this 40-day fast. It doesn't go into the details. But for the first five days, days you drink nothing but water. You're pur purifying yourself, cleansing your body out. And then you start taking this orm, and that's all you eat, just that orm. And what it does to you is it starts feeding your, your soul. But it's, it's called an impregnation, sort of. You're sort of impregnated with this seed. Now your body is starts gestating, and in nine months, you'll start developing these abilities, like Christ, to be able to walk on water, uh, levitate, disappear. In the actual scripture, when you're talking about all these people tried to lay hands on him and he, va he vanished, well, that's exactly what he did. He vanished. He didn't, you know, like in the movies where Robin Hood crawls out from underneath everybody's legs because they're all fighting in a big circle. That's not how he did it. He simply vanished. So the disciples weren't concerned when he got arrested. They thought he'd vanish, but he did not. Um, the arrest, I want to go over that real quick. He did it on purpose so that he could go ahead and have a catalyst to transmute him into this light body. When he was arrested, he was guilty of the offense against Caesar. And when you're looking at some of the headlines nowadays, you'll see the word sedition. And sedition has, a, um, has an interesting meaning because we never really used that word in our society before, 10, 10 years ago. It's just not going to be around. But right now, people are saying, oh, sedition against President Trump. When you say, let's assassinate the president, give his name, that's sedition. When you want to overthrow and put someone else in power, that's sedition. You're basically stating you don't want the person in power who's there. You want him out of there. It's just that sedition against the emperor was punishable by crucifixion. And Christ knew what he was doing. He was guilty, and he knew he would be arrested. When he was arrested, he was arrested by a tribune and his cohort. And a tribune is a commander of a Roman, part of a Roman legion. Legions were divided into um, 10 groups of 600 men. The entire legion was roughly 6,000. A cohort was 600. And each of the 10 cohorts were commanded by a tribune with six centurions, one for each 100 men. The uh, only Bible that I found that states that was the Roman Catholic Bible. It's in the book of John, when he, only in the book of John. Yes. And all the others state that it was a mob that came and grabbed him. So we have to understand first, it was an arrest for Rome. It was a Roman arrest against a charge leveled against Christ for sedition against the emperor. Yeah. It was at a time of a great feast, and a lot of people had come to this particular feast because of the works Christ had been doing. So it was a touchy, a touchy time to have their number one guy arrested. So the priest went ahead and took the um, criminal from him because he was a high, high visibility and VIP type individual. And they quickly convened a Sanhedrin, but it wasn't a full Sanhedrin of 70, was it 70 members? It was 22. In this Sanhedrin, uh, an emergency was called so that they could get these people in there. And they were trying all night to find something to pin on him. And when they say false witnesses, these guys who bore false witness, they weren't lying. They were not false witnesses in the way we understand a false witness. These men were saying exactly what they heard Christ say, that in three days he would rebuild the temple. They said it slightly different. One bordered on sorcery, the other one was simply um, psychotic. And so they didn't match. In order to have two witnesses that were credible, both had to hear him say the same exact thing on the same day, at the same location down to the very hour. Because these men's testimonies did not match, they were considered false witnesses. So legally, they tried everything they could to find something on him, threaten him with it, and then possibly get him to convert and become um, sort of an appointed priest because Christ was not a priest. And I've heard so many sermons out there about he was a rabbi. He hated that word. He did not want any of his followers to take that word rabbi, yeah. teacher. Yet we call him the, the priest uh, king, but he was not a priest. The priests were all born a specific bloodline. It was a Levite line or Aaron. So you have to take that into account. He was not a priest. He was of the line of David. And 
before Christ was ever in existence, I know you were familiar with the Savior gods. I don't know if other individuals are, but they should look them up. The Savior gods, starting with Horus, going over to Mithra. It's about a dozen guys, over a dozen, all over the world, who were all born of virgin mothers on December 25th. They suffered pretty much the same things Christ suffered, and they had uh, twelve. had disciples, some had 12. They were baptized, and these individuals were betrayed, they were crucified, and they resurrected from the dead. Now, Christ did resurrect. That was my re- what my research was originally on for the book Incredulous. And I show very clearly that he does. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. He was who he said he was, but he was not born of a virgin mother. The text was deliberately altered, and the translation was in error. It is an Alma, a young woman, eligible for marriage. Also from the Shroud of Turin, they were able to clone some of the blood that was on there. You don't have enough pairs to create a body, of course, but you could prove that it was an X chromosome in there. So he was human. And if he had not been human, his whole transformation into a light body would have been useless because if he was a demigod, he could transform into a light body. What good does that do us? We had to have an example, someone to show us that this is possible because this is what's about to happen to humanity. Anyway, he also had to be dead for three days. That was incredibly important. And he did not die on Good Friday and then remain in the tomb Saturday and resurrect Sunday morning. That's less than 36 hours. Back then, if you died, let's say you, your wife woke up and you're dead next to her. You were not considered dead yet. You have to be placed in a cool spot. They're going to keep an eye on you for three days. It's called the death watch because you could come back to life. And many people did. In France, when they were moving a cemetery out of the way, there was a highway coming through. They discovered that half the coffins were scratched up from the inside. These people came back to life. And they weren't sure what to do with this. So they went ahead and created what's called the coffins with the bells. And they would tie a bell, a string to your hand. The string would go through a hole in the coffin up to the top. And there'd be a little metal hanger there with a bell on it and a string tied to the bell. Then you had the guys doing the graveyard watch, graveyard shift. Usually two guys. If you ever see an old cart, uh, an old movie like Avenue Costello, there'll yeah. be two guys in the cemetery, and you can drive past cemeteries. There's nobody in the cemetery there that night waiting like that. They've yeah. got a shovel, a couple shovels. One guy's usually asleep. The other got a lantern. Usually a dog in the picture as well. They're waiting to hear that bell. When they hear that bell, they have to try and dig you out as fast as possible. And it was called Saved by the Bell. And uh, they've done away with that. They now do the um, embalming to ensure that you're not going to come back to life. But this was very common and it was well known. So Christ had to be dead for three days. And that's why he waited for Lazarus for four days. Now, the this Last Supper apparently occurred on a Tuesday. That would be a Tuesday night into the evening. He was arrested that night. Wednesday morning, he was tried. He was tried all night by the Jews, but Wednesday morning he was tried by the Roman trial. And then um, some interesting things happened during the the actual um, trial, and Pilate wanted nothing more to do with the arrest of Christ, but the Jews saw their chance to get rid of him. So when they were burying him that evening, the Jews have a a fascinating way of of keeping time. The ancients didn't keep it the way we do. When evening happens, like it does right now, it's, it's evening, the sun's gone down, that is now tomorrow. This would now be considered Monday. We're doing this Sunday night, the end of March here, 2017. So that night was be- what was called the Holy High Sabbath. It was the first day of the, of the week of bread celebrations. Passover had just ended. Holy High Sabbath, so we're not aware that they had two Sabbaths back to back. And the Sabbath could fall on any day of the week, the Holy High Sabbath, because it followed the full moon for it to be um, celebrated on the 14th of Nisan. Their calendars were aligned to the moon. So on Thursday, that would have been a day they had to rest according to the High Sabbath. Luke goes over this, chapter 23, verse 54. He says, they saw where he was being buried, but the high Sabbath drew near. Some just say the Sabbath drew near. So they couldn't do any work on that day. Friday, they were able to go and get the necessary myrrh, incense, flowers, perfumes that they needed for the burial because it was so sudden. So they went ahead and made preparations, but then they had to rest again. 
on the Sabbath according to the commandment. That would be Saturday, the seventh day, keep it holy, the commandment from the Bible. And then Sunday morning, the first day of the week, and you look at your calendar, Sunday is the first day of the week, he would have resurrected that morning. That's more than three days in the tomb. So that was really, really fascinating to me because I, I didn't see the importance of it. I also didn't understand why they would have had to guard it or place a seal on it. And that seal is what everything hangs on, whether he was real or wasn't real. Also, I discovered that he had an identical twin brother. So a lot of people jumped to the conclusion that the twin brother took over and he was the one saying that uh, he was Christ. And this twin brother was one of the 12 disciples and did work a tremendous amount of miracles. He returned with Mary to Kashmir, where Jesus had been during some of the missing 18 years. Their tombs are over there. Only some people think that that tomb might be the tomb of Jesus, because Mary's is so nearby. Well, anyway, um, I'll go ahead. To get into that, just to touch on it a little bit, um, like, why do you think they, they depict him, like, as white so much? Do you think it was because of, like, the, the, like, the hero's journey thing that we were talking about there, where it's always almost it seems like a light-skinned man with a beard, um, you know, that same Zoroaster... Quetzalcoatl, Kukulkan, that whole, the story is always like the bearded man, you know, even back to the Sumerians and Babylonians and things like that. And he always was light-skinned. Um, I just wondered why they depict Jesus as light-skinned all the time when in the Bible it kind of, I don't know, it's iffy at times. It says, you know, he had hair like wool. And sometimes it said, um, like, what, he had feet like bronze and eyes of fire and things like that. I just, I don't know if I get confused or... You know, I was just wondering if, you know, what you thought about that, why they depict him as white in most of the paintings. Like a Probably light. because um, Cleopatra in the movies is depicted as white, but she was black. Yeah. Being Anunnaki, descendant, she had six fingers and six toes. It was just our culture, I suppose. But he wasn't black. He no, was, um, was black. mulatto, I guess, kind of dark skin, not, not like Native American sort of, not really, yeah. really, really dark. No. Hey, I want to ask you, um, oh, go ahead. what's his name? David Wilcock. I've never heard him speak on this. Someone questioned him during a show. And it's a book that he's written that I haven't read yet. But he goes into something called The Black Jesus. And he said he was actually contacted and told, put that in there and you will be dead. That he went ahead and put it in there. And he goes over it, says this is all he knows about this. There was a man in Africa in the 60s performing miracles, much like Christ. He didn't claim to be Christ. He was just doing incredible miracles. They tried to assassinate him. They shot him in the head, and his head would come back together. They just kept trying to assassinate him in so many ways, and he just kept reforming. So then they told him that they needed him to speak in front of the United Nations. They had a special jet for him. They got him in the jet. They had... Uh, um, all means of devices in there where they killed him, cut him up into small pieces, put him into these chambers that were like a uh, missile looking sort of um, elongated football type of cartridges you would carry underneath of a, of a fighter jet. Yeah. And these had um, explosives in them. They put pieces of his body in every one of these. Somehow they was, transferred them onto jets while in flight flew to different locations on earth and blew them up to prevent him from ever being around. Apparently this guy re atomized himself in their presence in one of their offices later. And he said to them, okay, I guess I'm not going to stay here much longer. You guys aren't ready for me, but I'm coming back and many more like me are coming with me and you will not be able to stop us. So I found that fascinating because I'd never, ever heard it before. Yeah, Wilcox, he really, I, I think because he gets into so such credible stuff that he's, he's, he's really got like his foot in there so deep that uh, it's almost that they, they'd rather discredit than eliminate almost, if that makes sense, because mm -hmm. it, it, it just, it's just easier to do. I mean, if, all right, if anything adds credibility is it's murder, <laughs> you know, because that's like, I mean, you look at Robert Scott Harrington and things like that. I'd never bought that for a minute and anything around that. I mean, it alludes more to the truth. Like, okay, this is more of a cover. I mean, look at JFK. That was like the worst mistake they could have done. I think was that whole 
process. It was almost, they showed how far they'll go if they're going to assassinate their own presidents, things like that. But um, not to get off subject. But yeah. It's, mm-hmm. Will Cox, is, I, I think he is ahead of his time and most of his work will prove itself. So, you know. Especially that stuff. Also, like, um, Corey, good. Uh, Christ. Let's say, yeah, Corey's amazing. Um, with Christ, let's say we just, okay, some, he died, he was buried, and they forgot him. We can, you know, that's, that's a very viable explanation. The thing is that there were these two other guys at the same time that Christ was there. One was called Honi, the circle maker. He could make it rain. And Hania Bendoza was able to heal people at a distance. These two men's graves are venerated to this day. People know where they are. They're, they're very clean. They've got flowers and candles there the whole time. And they were there 2,000 years ago. So why was Jesus' tomb forgotten? Because there was nobody in the tomb to go put the flowers on. Yeah. Also, the very last thing that seals what he did was an actual event was that on the day he died, there were two massive eclipses. One occurred in the daytime. Apparently, the moon left orbit. This is well documented through Asia and other parts of the world. And some of the Christian paintings go over this. Um, the Kos- in Kosov, there's a painting behind the altar. shows the moon being piloted by someone and the moon and the sun in the sky during the crucifixion. It should have been a full moon um, eclipse. Not full moon, I'm sorry. A full moon that night. The moon should not have been in the sky. So apparently the moon did leave orbit, came around caused a massive earthquake at the time. It was well documented by historians. When it left, it caused a second earthquake. And then it came around and created um, a blood red eclipse that night. So there were two eclipses within hours of each other. This is interesting because one of the prophecies given by Joel concerning the Messiah was the sun will go dark at noon and the moon will be turned to blood. So that was fulfilled. The other thing is that it happened on the day when the Romans were worshiping their sun god, Sol Invictus, the spring equinox, the invincible sun. Since Rome was invincible, this was the sun they, they followed or you know, gave praise to whatever, and he protected them. So they had to eliminate this problem because the world would see them as weak. When they destroyed Israel, and they needed any, any flagrant excuse to do it, they finally found one. They attacked with 13 legions plus reserves. That's more than half of the armies of Rome against a city that has no army, no standing army whatsoever. They don't have a king. They don't have anything. Alexander conquered the world with 23,000 men. Titus had 80,000 at his disposal. And they brought in special engineers to dismantle all the walls of of the Temple Mound. Temple Mound was not just a simple temple. It had been built into what was part of a, of a very large valley by Herod the Great. And those stones, those massive stones, that you can't figure out how they got them up there that high, those are concrete. It's a very ancient form of concrete, the same kind of concrete that the pyramids are built. The ones that um, in Egypt, they're a form of concrete, harder than the stone they were quarried from. And the stones in Mexico, they're also concrete. And this concrete is so perfect, it is zero porosity. It will not expand in heat. It will not contract in cold. So they were building these things thousands of years ago. Anyway, inside of the um, Temple Mount was the storehouse of treasure of all the Jews on the planet. It was like a massive bank. Rome was bankrupt and they needed to get their hands on this. When Vespasian and Titus were given their cut from the from sacking the, I guess, the huge money um, vault of the Jews, they took a portion of that money and built the Colosseum with it. There's a stone, it's been removed, and they showed where the holes were in the stone and what words would have been on there. And the words were basically that Vespasian and Titus gifted this Colosseum to the people. Now remember, when they were building the temple, a lot of the, the priests, over a thousand of them, were trained in masonry to um, kind of like the guys who built the, the cathedrals of the 12th century. So they had the, the ability to create the Colosseum. And they were slaves, so it, didn't, it wasn't going to cost Titus anything to do that. When Titus attacked, he entered, he, when he entered the temple, this is recorded in the Talmud. Talmud is a record of writings by the Jews. 
And I think if they knew this was in reference to Christ, they would have probably not saved it. Yeah. Titus went in with a, yeah, he went in with a sword. He had two whores and a pig. And he had sex with the whores on the altar to defile it. I don't know if he had sex with the pig, but he killed the pig and spread his blood all over the, the altar there to defile the altar. This altar was quite a unique stone. And these stones were later hunted down by even the Spaniards and destroyed. They were at the position of a ley line, and these stones resonate. And that particular stone could not be cut by anything with metal. That's why it was kind of like a rough hewn. They had to break it with other stones. There was a stone like this in that um, city in the mount in the clouds up in Peru, and there were several other stones that the the Spaniards actually hunted down and, and broke to pieces. They were in the ley lines and they resonated with energy. So anyway, they figured that was kind of like the power of God. But when he entered the palace, well, not the palace, but the temple, he called it a palace. He states, "A man who vanquishes a king in the battlefield is great, but a man." who vanquishes a king in his own palace is greater still. The Jews had no king other than Jesus when Pilate had put on his uh, the tablet above his cross, Rex, king of the Jews. So that, I think, is the direct relationship to that, showing that Rome was more powerful and they were going to destroy it and that the king, their, their god wasn't as powerful as the Roman armies. So after that, uh, they started dismantling the the temple and taking the, the wealth with them back. But one of the walls was not dismantled. Legend says that he gave command to four of his nobles, each to dismantle the wall. And this one noble, I forget his name, but he did not do his job. He left part of the wall, the wailing wall. And so Tiberius, um, oh, Titus, I'm sorry, had him called for him and asked him why he failed in his duties. He said, I didn't fail. I got to thinking about it. And I realized that if you destroy every last remnant of the, of the Jews, history won't believe this temple ever existed. I wanted to leave this monument you know, to your glory so people would know what you had done. And that's the only reason the Wailing Wall remains to this day. So um, more than half of the legions to destroy Israel was a huge number. And then when Titus got back to Rome, he was given the Ark of Titus, the, an ark was only, I realize he was the son of Vespasian, the emperor, but an ark could only be erected to a general who was facing insurmountable odds. When you've got half of the armies of Rome attacking a defenseless city other than its walls, you're not outnumbered. Unless you're fighting against a god who took the moon, moved it out of orbit, placed it over his dying king, because eclipses were feared because the king was going to die. And so here's the entire universe saying, this guy is who he said he was. And now they have to sort of reestablish themselves on the planet as the, the major uh, superpower. Anyway, the, none of that makes sense. The fact that they, they built um, an arch to him and also they minted more coins of that victory than any other victory Rome ever had in more quantities and more denominations. And they've always been puzzled by that because it was their greatest victory. They had won against the God of the universe. So there was a being named Christ. He was guilty. He was not an innocent lamb led to slaughter to die for our sins. And he was trying to demonstrate what's about to happen to us. And he said, you're going to do this too. And you're going to do it faster than I did. Now, some people think, no, no, the Bible is perfect. It's never been altered. Every word is exactly the way it was. That's not exactly true. The Torah is that way. They will actually count every letter. And some guys, that's all their job is, just to count every single letter on a page of a Torah. And they have to match the Torah. one before it has to hit. Hmm? The Torah is amazing in itself. It's like how, because when you start learning how the Hebrew is broken into numbers and letters and things like that, and then they get specific and only reference numbers as numbers, specific times in the Bible mm -hmm. and things like that. I mean, you, you've touched on a lot. Um, like, like the, you think about the book of Enoch, they left it out, I believe, because not only it reveals a lot, but it, owns, it also depicts Christ as the, the Messiah. I mean, it would prove, you know, it'd be, there's a big agenda of why you would leave that out of your holy books. Right. I mean, especially because look at the, the Jewish faith and things like that. And, 
as you said, the fasting and things like that. I've seen that there are studies that uh, when you start fasting after a certain point, your body actually starts to uh, produce DMT um, more in your pineal gland, thing like that, things like that. So, yeah, it's uh, everything that you touched on. I mean, they're great puzzle pieces. Uh, sorry, I had to throw the book of the Enoch. No, it's cool. The book of Enoch, Jesus quotes from it constantly yeah I mean, you would know that if, if it never existed right. it, it didn't just get shot and lost in the shuffle it was deliberately hunted down and destroyed yeah. it wasn't until um, about a hundred years ago that this uh, explorer from scotland found copies of it in ethiopia where they said the ark was taken to because the son of manalek the son of uh, solomon manalek the firstborn was um was cast out basically he wasn't allowed to rule because he wasn't pure israelite so he took the ark with him down there. And that's where they found the book of Enoch. Also, uh, just to give you an example of the mistranslation in the Bible, a very simple mistranslation. Jesus cannot lie to your face. As far as I know, he can't. <laughs> You're dying and he just lies. as completely, complete lie to you just to make you feel better. Okay, he would not do that. But when he's on the cross and the guy on the cross, one of the other ones, says, Lord, remember me when you enter paradise. Okay, first off, that word paradise, that's an English word, has no reference whatsoever to the Hebrew words. He, what he said was, Lord, remember me when you enter the realm of souls. And that's exactly where Christ was going. It's not hell. He wasn't descending into hell to um, save us of our sins. The realm of souls is sort of a holding place. It's not a purgatory and the two guys who were crucified with him were named Cestus and Gastus. They were disciples of Jesus. They were members of the 60 disciples. They were selected by Judas Iscariot because they were zealots, and uh, they died with him. So when he reappears in the realm of souls in the book of Peter, he happens to have two disciples with him, although Peter doesn't mention that because he preaches to the people who died before the flood there in the realm of souls. But again, that's, that's not hell. There is a hell. I, I'm fully aware there's a hell. And we just simply were not designed to go there. Okay, That has, has nothing to do with the teachings of Christ. I, the other I, thing I wanted to cover. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that um, when you look at a lot of the ancient cultures, even the, the Vikings, I mean, it, 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 it's very, I mean, they use beasts and creatures and things, but it, it really sounds like the same you know, like Ragnarok almost sounds like, you know, the book of Revelation at times when you really compare them and things like that. It, it gets really interesting that like when you talk about hell and things like that, because it's almost like a, the pendulum of karma, like you're getting held back a year. Instead of getting held back a year, you're getting like pushed down to like a lower frequency because you're not resonating with this you know to reincarnate in this one or a higher one or something it's almost like like you said we're not all designed that way but um when reincarnation comes back maybe uh that happens to the people of lower uh vibration or a lower frequency you know people that kinda... yeah the bible the bible actually calls it continuing life reincarnation apparently means you can come back as a butterfly or something but continuing life you would just you know, be recycled, sort of. Yeah, the and human, come back, be born again. Infinite, yeah. The human soul is totally different, I believe, than um, some of the things that animate, animate, like, you know, the the lesser things in life, almost it seems. But mm -hmm. like different stages. But uh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you there and oh, kill your career. It's okay. We were talking. We were talking about. Um, you mentioned JFK, and I had mentioned there was a, a shift in the timeline. And I had wanted to know, well, what happened? Where, where was the whole the Antichrist, all that stuff? Where did that take place? Because I had been looking for it forever. I had always studied it and thought it would happen. Yeah. But it didn't happen. And I know we're beyond that now. I was shown that JFK was protected in that timeline. In that timeline, he helped put an end to the military-industrial complex. And they started building hospitals, schools and uh, clinics and roads for other countries and bringing them water and electricity. So of course, countries wanted the, um, what are those guys called? Peace, the Peace Corps? They yeah. wanted those guys over there helping. And that's what the Peace Corps really was intended to do. And then you've got his brother coming in after him. And so that for 14 years, they were able to change the world. 
And it would make sense if a country like the U.S. was doing that for other countries in the world, that all the countries would kind of come together. It wouldn't even have to be the U.S.'s idea. They would just come together and say, hey, we just form a one world government. You guys can lead us. You're doing such a good job helping everybody out. So then you got your one world government and then you're set up for the one world leader. And interestingly enough, the, I don't know, I keep calling the Anunnaki, the elite, if they really wanted a one world government, that's all they had to do. Just gave us ungodly amounts of money and, and easy jobs, plenty of vacation and, and nice schools. And people would gladly go to a one world government. They want, they're always wanting to control and then do so much wickedness. Yeah, the, the fear is the, the key that goes back to that root principle. It's almost like if I were to throw a ball at you, you would keep catching that ball or trying to move out of the way of that ball. So I keep acting and you keep reacting the way I want you to based on the react the action I'm giving. And you never get a chance to get ahead, you know what I mean? It's almost like sometimes you just got to take one off and just – Go forward with your own plans, you know, stop reacting out of fear and just, you know, transmute that. Mm -hmm. It's like polarity. <laughs> you can always insert so, hope where there's fear, you know, you can hope the next day is going to be good or you can fear that it's going to be bad. But go ahead. Mm -hmm. And I had wondered, I had mentioned Dolores Cannon and the volunteers who came in. Dolores said something horrible had happened in the future. And I had heard that from other individuals. June Volvo mentions that as well. But no one ever tells you what it was. It was a tyranny. Tyranny had taken root in the galaxy, is all they mention. And what it was, was basically the new world order across the galaxy, ruled by reptilians. And you could not have a, a child born who was spiritual because the birthing centers were controlled and they would eliminate you at birth. Apparently they're doing that today, where you have these walk-ins. And the reason you have walk-ins is so that the child will not be destroyed when he's in the hospital because people are monitoring this. And so at a later age, that individual walks out of the body and the other one walks into it. And that's apparently why they're using walk-ins. One of the reasons. Anyway, the, um, what happens in the future is in that future, Kennedy's become president. They changed the world. And these guys were not Lily white. Trust me. I, I know they were responsible for the death of Marilyn Monroe and a few other things but they did assist the world to move in the right direction. And so people were happier. There was a utopia. And in this realm, this area of space that we're entering, this highly energized area of space, the human brain grows crystals in it. And these crystals are magnetic in nature. You might want to Google that's an epidemic among the elite because um, they're not eating Monsanto franken food. They're not drinking fluoride in their water. And they're not stressed out like we are. So they're growing these crystals. We're stressed out, and most of our pineal glands are calcified, so we're not growing these crystals. These crystals is what gave the reptilians the upper hand and allowed them to conquer the galaxy in the fourth and fifth dimensions. I believe that they have been infiltrated with these beings who were born in the waves that Dolores Cannon speaks of. And I believe they've done everything in their power to prevent the reptilians from ever getting their hands on those crystals because they allowed the Kennedys to be assassinated. And so the um, powers that are in charge keep trying to weaken our immune systems, spray the air with all these toxins and poisons and put more stuff in our food to hurt us, and keep us weak. They don't realize that our brains can grow the most powerful elements in the entire galaxy. Um, dilithium crystals in Star Trek is what they're called. So these things would be a lot like a dilithium crystal. You'd have a tremendous amount of power. You could power cities with one of these little crystals. But the crystal in your brain doesn't have that kind of power. It's just potential for that kind of power. The shock waves that are coming to Earth are what energizes these crystals. And the shock wave that energizes these crystals happened in uh, March of 2013. The particular shock wave wasn't all that strong compared to the one that's coming. But right now, I don't know how many of us would have these crystals in our in our brain, but they can be combined and used for the Stargate technology. And um, I'm learning a lot more Stargates from Corey Good. He breaks it down really, really well, how they were operating. Anyway, that's, uh, that's a big part of our history, why so many billions were born on Earth, why so many came back here. They didn't come back here to be human. They didn't, you're not here to learn lessons. You've, you've learned those before. 
you were volunteered, you were asked to come and you did agree to come. And the reason you did wasn't to help Earth or the Earthlings so much, it was to prevent this tyranny from reaching your world because there was nothing you could do to fight it. And I found it fascinating in the, in the movie of X-Men where they had to go back into the past and stop the war before it happened. And that's pretty much what we did. We were born here and we knew something was wrong. People didn't think the way we thought. They didn't see things the way we saw. We wanted to go home. We didn't know where home was, but this wasn't it. And that's why we have these feelings, these, these longings. We know the world should be different. It shouldn't be the way it is. And others can't really see that. But the earth itself, souls come from creator. And each planet only has so many souls that go to it. This planet has billions and billions of souls that come from all over the galaxy. And most of them had to be human before they were ever sent here for the first time. Because it's not easy to be disconnected from creator and be thrown into this darkness. You also have to be among the bravest and greatest warrior masters to even attempt to come into this kind of darkness and turn it into light at the ages some of the older ones came in, but they were able to establish a beach beachhead and raise the frequency and stop some of the abuse that was going on in their families by not repeating it in their own. And then the next group was able to come in and it wasn't as dark and they were able to raise the frequency and the next group came in. And that's why I believe the apocalypse never happened because the frequency was raised high enough that it just simply didn't, didn't form in the human, didn't take root in human consciousness and, um, and manifest. Yeah. So when you get into that, it's this, almost like there's, there's comets that like come near Earth and things like that. It's almost like sometimes like if we will those things to like doom us, they would. But like, you know, just like the hail ball and things that we were talking about earlier. It's almost, like, you know, very interesting what you're getting into there. So I'll let you go. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to when the shockwave hits us and the information I have from uh, a, a guy with military intelligence his name is John Moore. We were talking about that. He was, had brought up the shockwave and he asked when I thought it was coming in. I'm not sure. I'm guessing about two years. And he said his sources are telling him 20 to 21 months the shockwave is coming. There are shockwaves hitting us right now. You can feel that the, the frequency of the planet, like I said, the Schumann resonance just keeps going higher and higher. So when we get hit with this shockwave, it's going to transmute our bodies and right now there are animals on the planet that are just completely uh, new to this planet. I've seen them. They're amazing because the frequencies from the center of the galaxy are already changing some of these uh, life forms. And this takes me to the experiment with the salamander that they created from a frog egg. David Wilcock covers this pretty well. But they took a laser light, soft green laser light, shot it through the egg of a frog into a salamander and from the salamander grew. I mean, from the frog egg through a perfect salamander, he was able to reproduce. There was no genetics involved, just light transmission, cohesive light transmitting information from the frog egg into, uh, I'm sorry, from the salamander egg into the frog egg. I think I got that backwards. Because from a frog egg, they grew a salamander. They also reversed the process. So when this light hits us, this energy this frequency, we become these light bodies. And this goes all the way back to the central sun, the 26,000 year gigantic cycle of the, of the zodiac. That cycle, every 26,000 years, it turns out that our galaxy, I believe, is a safer galaxy, meaning it's a quasar. They've got a new satellite out there. When they took pictures of the center of the galaxy, they noticed these two massive plumes of energy shooting out from the center of the galaxy both above the disk and below the disk. Nothing can escape a black hole, so now they have some new formulas to have to calculate or create, invent, try and figure out what's causing this. What's causing this is that the center of our galaxy has ignited and become a quasar again. It's part of the gigantic cycle. That's why the Mayans called it the Great Central Sun. They call it the Black Sun now because it's not lit up. But it's a, it's a massive sun that lights up. It's almost the size of the galaxy once it's fully inflamed, the electricity of it. And shadows are almost nowhere to be found because there's just light everywhere. Plus, you have your additional sun giving you light. And in the end of days, it says that there will be no more shadows, that everything will have light. So that's part of that. You were speaking of these ages that come in... Uh, 
at the ages of men in quarters, you got the golden age, you got your silver age, you got your bronze age, and you got your iron age, which is the darkest. And this is considered to be the darkest before the light, before the dawn right now. So when this um, shockwave hits us, apparently planet X is going to be uh, pretty close to us as well. And what I discovered when I was in Houston doing some work with some groups up there, there are, I already know there's fleets out there. There's many, many fleets out there. So a lot of people jump to the conclusion there must be a galactic battle taking place or we're being guarded for some reason because something's trying to get us. That's not necessarily the case. The reptilians have pretty much lost the war right now. What is happening is that some of these ships were specifically constructed for what's about to happen. They're living. They're uh, living biomechanical devices, uh, kind of like Moya on um, Farscape. These ships and their crew believe in us so much that they're willing to sacrifice their lives if this doesn't go right. Because we have their DNA in us, and they hope that through some form of osmosis or entrainment, that when we start changing to light bodies and the shockwave hits their ship, which will be exposed, they will change into light bodies. And it's a big leap of faith on their part. These people aren't accustomed to going on leaps of faith. <laughs> they either know something or they don't. So they're taking a big leap. But what I also discovered, and this was just happened yesterday, was that when this happens, it is un the undoing of the reptilians and any other, the archons, anyone else, because they've linked themselves to us. The reptilians through the reptilian brain they put in us, the archons through other energy forms. But when we become, should we become light bodies, that energy follows that conduit all the way back and gives them a full blast of that energy, which is about as close to godlike as possible. And they will not be able to withstand it. So it'll be the end of them as well. And that's exactly what Revelation says, that this fire will come and burn, and there will be uh, no evil left. And they call these this light, ancients called anything that was light, like St. Elmo's fire, a fire. But it's not some sort of electroplasma energy, very high frequency, love would be the closest I could call it. And you hear people channeling saying there's a wave of love coming to earth, a very powerful wave. Well, this is what they're talking about. Also, uh, when Christ said it'll be as in the days of Noah, he's referring to the end of days. In the days of Noah, planet X caused the, the flooding. That was about 7,000 years ago. And 3,600 years ago, it caused the plagues of Exodus. Those are documented all over the world. It caused a tremendous amount of damage, and it passed between the earth and the sun. There was a, a galactic war that took place, and when this war took place, it destroyed the world that was on this side of Jupiter. The remnants of much of that world were dragged away in the gravity well of Nibiru, or Planet X. So it's, it seems to have slowed it down or caused more drag on it, because it never used to come this close into the system. It used to be farther out, past Mars, and now it's coming in between us and the sun. If you've ever seen Major Ed Dame's The Kill Shot on YouTube, it's called The Kill Shot. Yeah. He mentions that in remote viewing, they saw an object, a very large object, move in front of the sun, and then the sun started firing flares, and those flares hit the Earth. He never mentioned Planet X. Not once did he ever speak of it being Planet X. The very last day, when he was in uh, Reno, Nevada, he, he did state, Planet X is real, it's coming, that's what they saw. And he said he was not going to be giving any more interviews and he was not going to make any more public appearances. I'm sure they did not want him saying that. That, that gave it a tremendous amount of credibility in my book. Yeah, when, when he did that and just, like he was basically in tears from what I heard and he just like rolled out. Like he was probably doing that for his own protection too. <laughs> you know. <laughs> You say something like that, you don't go making another statement after that, after you've been basically, the get, he had government credibility, you know, he was in, uh, you know, the whole men who stare at goats was basically about the people in his military project and things like that, so, you know. Yeah, I really like that movie. Yeah, I mean, it was a cool movie, I think George Clooney played really well in that, but yeah, that's another subject. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's pretty you know what's funny? Hold on. Go ahead. I was listening to the I was listening to the editor of the when the editors talk. I mean the editors, the directors. Yeah. When they're talking, um, comments. They said that the main director didn't realize that uh, Gwen, 
Owen McGregor, I guess his name. Yeah. That he had that he had been a Jedi in the movie Star Wars. He he didn't it didn't snap. So when they're talking Jedi, he's like freaking out. He goes, "Oh no, we're gonna have to find another actor." <laughs> yeah. And uh, and they tried to calm him down. Said, "No, no, this is perfect. This is perfect." Yeah. It was really weird because in that movie when they they were they he kept drawing that symbol, you know, the eye and the triangle and things like that. When I was a kid, my mom, uh, she always used to sit there and she she never knew why, but she'd always doodle these eyeballs and things like that. And she'd only draw one eye, you know, and it'd have the eyelashes and stuff like that. But I always thought that was odd. And when I watched that movie, it all kind of clicked together, you know what I mean? It was in my face, like just in this like old dormant memory that, you know, from my childhood. But I always thought it was odd because I even asked her about it. Like, hey, why did you always draw that? And just, I don't know. It was like. Oh, I do. <laughs> like it was just like a doodle that would come to mind, and you know, like her inspiration, I guess. It was pretty odd. Oh, I also wanted to cover. Um, what was his name? Father Malachi Martin. Yeah. He actually spoke about the third prophecy of Fatima, or on it, really. He wasn't. He wasn't allowed to speak of it. He was allowed to read it by the Pope he was serving. He was allowed to come to the U.S. And basically, be only under that Pope's command. And he wrote several novels based on truth, pretty much all the pedophilia and Satan worshiping stuff going on in DC. But he mentioned that this, the prophecy dealt with a cosmic influence. It was not something on earth and it was major. He said it would be here in about 20 years. That was 1997 and we're at about 20 years right now. The Vatican had their observatory over in, in um, Rome and they've got a, a satellite I forget its name, but the, uh, NASA launched it for them. And they also have those two binocular infrared scopes um, that are down in that several scopes over on Mount Graham in Arizona. Yeah. That is completely controlled by them. They are watching this thing. They know it's coming in. And they've actually been rewriting the Gospels to include the Anunnaki in it or something similar to it. Because once that shows up and once the stuff down in Antarctica is released, a lot of this, a lot of Christianity is, is out the window. But when you realize that if the moon was orbited, moved, piloted, out of orbit, and the Anunnaki are in control of that moon, then they're somehow linked to what Jesus did because he had to die on that specific day to make the least amount of damage to Earth by taking the moon out of orbit and bringing it back. Yeah. Also, the astronauts, I do believe, landed on the moon. I don't think they landed where they said they landed because the right now the Chinese are rather upset that their their rover, their lunar rover, has not found any evidence of the astronauts having been on the moon. Have you heard of that? Yeah, I was uh, reading into that uh, um, in a couple articles. I never seen how credible it was. Um, I always try to check the sources, so I never really talked about it too much, but I did see into that. But, uh, I mean, did you ever watch mm. Stanley Kubrick getting drilled? I mean, he had that interview where he was supposed to be releasing, you know, that he shot the, the film for the, the moon being faked and stuff like that. But if you watch the actual full footage, the guy's staging it right in front of him, telling him what to say, yelling at him, screaming at him, trying to get him like to say this and say that and what to say. And Stanley's like freaking out and going like through like a panic attack and shit like that. It's crazy, man. Like they literally like made a staged, staged moon landing video. <laughs> they staged. Well, they, they did. They said they staged many of them. The lunar lander that, that thing with the four legs that's on the moon. When it landed, the astronauts aren't sitting down. You're not laying down to protect your backbone. You're standing up. And yeah. all you have is this little, not even a, a, a safety belt. It's just a little clip like you see at the carnivals. And that's it. That's the only thing holding you in your little cute little corner of this section of the ship. And when you're landing, you're standing up. That is a heck of a jolt to your backbone. You're going to get some injuries out of that. But when they landed here on Earth, that lunar lander landed four times. It only made four landings. It exploded on three landings, but it did land safe once, so I guess they thought it was good to go. When it was landing the other three times, the rocket that was shooting down to the Earth was propelling all kinds of material out, creating a small um, crater, and the rocks that got shot out of there broke the legs off of the lunar lander, so when it finally did touch down, it rolled over on the side and exploded. Only one time did it not break a leg and explode. But when you see the moon shots, any one of the moon shots, I don't care which one it is, go to any one of the moon shots, you'll see them standing next to the lunar landers. There's a black area. They spray paint it down on the ground there. There is no crater there. None of them have a crater. 
Yeah, I, I think that they seen, I think they made contact when they went to the moon and the footage they had where they couldn't show, obviously, if they're saying, when you I mean, if you make the audio tapes match and the stuff that the ham radio guys that they pulled back from the emergency broadcast transmissions and things that, that they were listening, you know, because they, they were doing it on ham radio frequencies and things like that. They have those recorded. And then if you go look into Apollo 20 and all the gold and, you know, these, the Mona Lisa, the whatever you have it all starts to make a big make a lot more sense that that's why they'd have to stage this. They did go there, but they obviously didn't want to tell us the truth about what happened. You know, I, I completely believe it. And then some of them, they just make up this, Oh, the Van Allen radiation belt and this and that, like, Oh, we can't go there. It's like, well, yes, you can. I believe that. I don't believe for a second that we couldn't make it to the moon. We probably have set up on Mars or something. They're not telling us, you know, I, I I completely believe it's to deceive us, you know, kind of like War of the Worlds type stuff, you know, make everybody feel foolish mm -hmm. so they don't talk about it or think about it, you know. They feel like yeah, foolish. and <laughs> go ahead. Corey and David, that's that's the only problem I have with um, David's story. Everything else matches. All his evidence weighs in great. Whoever gave him the information about the moon has got to be incorrect, though because they say the moon was created by these progenitors and it was created by nanite that sort of just kept building and building until they created this huge moon the way they wanted it for future use. The thing is that um, the moon is hollow. It is artificial, but it was not here more than 12,000 years ago. And these beings were here long before 12,000 years ago. I have a friend of mine who has tremendous amount of memories of being on Atlantis. And I asked her one time, I said, hey, can you do me a favor? Just close your eyes. And can you tell me that you see the moon while you're at Atlantis? Can you look up in one, any one of your memories and see the moon? And she closed her eyes. <laughs> her eyes got really wide. Her mouth dropped open. And she had this look of shock on her face. And it almost seemed like she was thinking, I must be delusional because I don't see moon. And that's exactly what I expected her to say. There, there was no moon at that time not as we have it also because earth was newly formed and the uh, continents were still breaking up at that time 12,000 years ago the atlantic and pacific ocean are almost the same age if you do core drillings when the moon got into orbit and started orbiting around earth it caused an explosion of light on earth a life on earth also planet x is going by and peppering us with this phosphorus phosphorus is one of the key elements of life on earth yet there's very little phosphorus on land. It seems to be getting, you know, seeded every so, so often. And it's every 3,600 years, we're completely covered in, in this red phosphorus, which all, you know, the blood in your veins has it. It's iron. But iron is a heavy element. So in the construction of a planet, it would have sunk down below the surface. It wouldn't be on land. They've never been able to explain why Earth has so much phosphorus on, on it. And, and so because of that, the fact we had the moon orbiting, creating cycles, and and a brand new species that was still developing earth is unlike any world out there and that's where we have such an abundance of life on the planet if you've ever meditated to go to any other worlds they're very desert looking like very very basic very simple and and not a whole lot of diversity on uh, on the plant life pretty much same plant life all over the world yeah seasons like go away from the equator you know like the most planets don't really have seasons they have a distance from no the equator <laughs> and they have tropical right and that's it that's you have a season wherever you live and that's it <laughs> so yeah and our seasons with the rain create um sediment that gets pulled out and moved to the ocean so we have erosion there's only about at the most fourteen thousand years of erosion on the planet if we're billions of years we should have a lot more erosion than that yeah, and the, the, when you you really got me onto that subject, um, when you think about the Tiamat, and I, I mean, I have paperwork that I'm getting ready to actually. You gotta, it's thirty dollars to buy, but um, uh, Thomas Van Flandern and um, Robert Harrington talking about this planet being destroyed by this other planet, giving the evidences, giving the evidence that Mars was probably the moon of it, this, that, and the other. It goes into like extreme detail, and um, it, it, Mars was a moon. In like this, this Just like you think of the fossil records we have here and stuff like that, and of all these creatures, everything so much bigger. It's because you know it's made up 
from this other planet, all this stuff, you know, and even the ancient technology that's out of place and things like that. And you, you think about that, like, well, that could have just came from this other planet when it was destroyed or, you know, flash frozen, things like that. I mean, it makes total sense. We have plate tectonics here and no other planets have those. Um, everything about it. I mean, you really. Yeah, the other thing is uh, the prison planet thing. That's what's really wild because there was a prison planet. The AIs during the ancient galactic battles had created a prison planet where they would put the more advanced warrior souls there. But then after those wars ended and the planet was still a prison planet, we're talking Tiamat here, not Earth. Yeah. But Earth is part of Tiamat. The, um, the other cultures realized, hey, if you drop pedophiles here and psychopaths, they won't come back. They won't be reborn into our society. So they would just drop them here. And when Earth remained a remnant of that uh, sort of broke off and became its own little world, those souls apparently came with us. Also, the, um, what do you call it, the AI supercomputer, wherever that was, it was not on Earth. It was not where we were. Because Earth still has that black ooze all over its, um, its ley lines. But it's not being commanded and controlled by something. It's doing its own thing. Basically, if it infects you, it starts trying to repair you, fix you, make you better, make you smarter, make you speak more languages, whatever, healthier. And so um, that's why they destroyed it. They, it was destroyed during the battle, so the reptilians would not get their hands on it because they were losing, and they did not want the reptilians to get their hands on this technology. However, Earth, being a remnant of that world, is a prison planet. And I'm hearing a lot more people saying that, should you transition, don't go to the white light. Go to blue light, go to magenta light, go to golden white, golden white's the best, or call for angels to assist. Do not go to the white light. It's basically going to stun your soul, shock you, and you're going to be reborn on Earth without memories of what took place. So, uh, it is still a prison planet. However, we did volunteer to come here, so we will be taken off of it. I, uh, I find that fascinating, that subject, because it, it made perfect sense why they would have destroyed that world. They could not allow that world to get into the hands of the reptilians. Yeah. And the reptilians weren't aware it was there. Somehow well, they didn't seem to realize it. You look at the Enuma Elish and like the Sumerian texts about it, and you, it, they're talking about creatures and serpents and giant lizards and things like that. You think about the dinosaurs, exactly the same thing. It's like they're painting this false fit picture for you and grabbing at any like straws that they can, but they know blatantly like what the truth is from basically from these texts like reverse engineering the texts if you will using science and testing it and then like wow this makes sense you know uh, uh, you know this knowledge is passed down to these initiated people in these cultures these you know these alien races that r like run the show behind the scenes and i believe that like uh too many of the puzzle pieces exist for us to just not connect the dots that like that blatantly you know i can i completely mm -hmm mean about like the prison planet and things like that when you just look at what the texts say about it i mean <laughs> well the anunnaki living so many millions of years because of the white powder gold they wouldn't have experienced being trapped on the planet and because the first humans didn't have souls they were androgynous they wouldn't have had any any knowledge of that it would just been a, a body so no, they didn't even realize they were on that kind of world but marduk uh, marduk is one of the the members of the 12th the council of the anunnaki these guys rule over a period of time an age of the zodiac 2160 years roughly and in the enuma elish when he becomes the number one leader in rank and number he has it read to everyone that you know he is the one god that he created earth that he created man. Well, technically he did assist in the creation because his father is Enki and he did create in his, his aunt. Um, what is her name? Uh, she has a weird name. Nerta. Anyway, she, she was the other. Go ahead. I think it was Ninurta. Is that who you mean? Yeah, yeah. No, wait. Ninurta is his, uh, is his cousin. There's so many of them. <laughs> I cannot remember. I can't remember her name for some reason. But she is sort of like the mother of creation. She's the one that actually created the Adam. She's the chief. Uh, uh, genetic scientist and e Enki is more of an engineering type scientist but he does do a lot of genetics in the Enuma Elish though Marduk states that you know he is the one god they're supposed to worship because he created earth and technically he did he was in charge of the armada that was ordered to destroy it from the captured satellite 
that they took the captured war carrier of the reptilians and flew it into that world and blew it up. When they blew it up, it created Earth. So, yeah, he created Earth. So he had all this written and it had to be read out every year to everybody. The English. And uh, Gerald Clark, when he he references, he doesn't really use Zachariah Sitchin because a lot of people attack him. He uses the Enuma Elish because that is very well documented that this was well known. It was read every year. Mm -hmm. And that information uh, is well established. What's in there and everything we're talking about is in the Enuma Elish. Oh, yeah. You can read it um, at the University of Cambridge. They actually have the cuneiform depicted, and you can actually use it as a cipher. You can just have this cipher up, and it took a long time, but you can read them yourself. And Sitchin wasn't wrong in, in his interpretations, like not in any sense of it. I believe he was actually closer to the root words that many people were believing because he was going back to that era, going back to the references and the context because every, everything is context sensitive, man. That's like the whole idea of language and how you get a point across. So if they didn't have a word for a star back then, even, I mean, that's, that says a lot, you know, they kind of had like planets well, look at and things like that, but it was all general speaking, you know, but go ahead. Look at the, okay, a star, a star was, um, the planets, the planets were considered moving stars. Remember wandering stars? Yeah. The sun was considered a planet. The moon is considered a planet. All the stars that move around were wandering stars. All the other stars were just fixed stars. Just stars. So th that you don't, they didn't have that concept that this is a world you can live on. They were called the, the wandering planet, the wandering stars. So mm -hmm. those were later known as the planets. Um, however, Zachariah did not get his information from there. He got it from somewhere else. And Sophia, the one who wrote the Matrix, she actually met with him. And he was given this information by somebody because you cannot read those texts and put together the story he put together. The information is in them, but that story is not in there. Yeah. So they've always criticized him for that. Also, he was a very high-level Mason, and his degree in the university where he graduated is in economics, not in language. He doesn't have any courses in language that I'm aware of. No. So he basically taught himself this and then was told the story and he had to go find the information to make, to put it out there, basically. To, this information was allowed to be released and he was the one that selected to release it. So he did a good job, the best he could with what he had. Well, if you're speaking Hebrew, if you can learn and speak he Hebrew, I imagine going back to like something like the basics of writing and things like that honestly would go, you know, like a second nature to you because I, I guarantee you that's complicated when you get into doing things like that, you know? And uh, mm. it's like I said, you're going back to the root. So it, I, I imagine just an intelligent person like that would be, you know, I, like I said, I, I don't criticize him. I don't think he, if anybody has it all figured out, but I think that everything he said was very credible because he didn't try to m make any extravagant claims saying anything too, too far out there that you couldn't back up with evidence all around the world, you know what I mean? Like, he didn't go and say like doomsday's coming he didn't he, you know i think his estimation was like uh 28 2080 something like that and he said that they'd probably have to get here a couple years before that at least because of the slingshot effect and then they'd have to leave early to get on you know like he had this whole i'm surprised he didn't try and he didn't try and link it to the to the exodus because it, it fits perfectly with the Exodus. Yeah. And the Exodus, according to the Jews, happened 1250 BC, but that's not when it happened. It happened back in 1550 BC. And if you ever see the Exodus decoded, which is on YouTube, with um, it was made by Joseph Cameron and Zimka Djokovic. He's the one narrating it. And they show that the Exodus actually took place about 350 years earlier than the Jews say it happened, and that's when the last pass over of uh, Planet X happened. Yeah. Well, if you consider, like, Exodus, I mean, I think I heard him talking about the Exodus on uh, Coast to Coast, but it wasn't, like, any of his, in any of his writings. It was uh, more like a speculation than when he was getting famous and things like that. But um, I guess he didn't want to assume anything he couldn't prove. But if you go back into the cultures, I mean, it said, what, uh, three days of darkness, something like that, three and a half days. And then there's a different time. There was three and a half hours. That I believe that was what the that was when Christ was what I can't remember. You, you're you're more. Oh, during the during the eclipse of yeah. that the 
the moon was much closer and stood in, in a position directly over Israel for three and a half hours. Yeah, so Eclipses how, take about 11 minutes, eight minutes. They don't stand there for hours. Exactly. And it was supposed to be a Passover celebrated on what, a new moon? On, oh. no, actually, the beginning of the month is new moon, full moon. Oh. All, their, all their celebrations are on full moons. Full moon, exactly. So a full moon, it would be opposite side of the sky. It, there's no way a full moon could cause uh, like an eclipse. <laughs> a solar a solar eclipse solar right. eclipse that's what i'm saying there's no way it could cause there's just no way it there's that doesn't it doesn't go with the dates so there's it has to obviously been moved or another object you know it's really and this information that i've come across I, I was not looking for it i was not i had no idea it was even out there my research dealt with the crucifixion and the fact that Jesus had an identical twin brother who was had to be destroyed the same way Mary Magdalene had to be destroyed. In, um, I really liked the Da Vinci Code because I got into uh, Rennes-le-Chateau. At the back of Rennes-le-Chateau, behind the altar, is a statue of Joseph and one of Mary. You can go on the internet and see the different pictures of it. And those two statues to the right and the left, each one is holding a Christ child. And that's one of the insinuations of the uh, of the twin leonardo da vinci in the last supper paints the twin to the left side of jesus and that's where judas should have sat on the left side of jesus also nicholas poussin and his his name is spelled rather interesting it's french p-o-u-s-s-i-n now when berge saunier when he had to go to, into Paris and buy the paintings that were going to help him decode the message, you had to decode and, and find out what the uh, Templars had left behind. Nicholas Poussin's painting of uh, No Temptation, on the Shepherdess No Temptation, that was the one he purchased. But Nicholas Poussin did two separate uh, self portraits of himself, and one self portrait. He is not wearing a Masonic ring. In the second one, he is. In the second one, he's holding a book at 23 and a half degrees, and he's holding a pen at six degrees. So Tiamat pretty much rotated at about six degrees, and Earth now rotates at 23 and a half degrees off. Also, uh, he painted something called the, um, the Eucharist. And Eucharist is spelled E-U-C-H-A-R-I-S-T. It means like the holy wafer. The Eucharist when they give that out in Catholic um, churches. But he had already painted these. He painted seven of them again before he was initiated into these mysteries. Afterwards, he repainted them, repainted every one of them. And in those paintings, there is a double. And that double is identified as Judas Iscariot. And the best painting I have ever seen of the Last Supper is his last painting, I mean, his painting, because it's a square table and they're all laying on the floor with their elbow on a little cushion. They're not sitting at a table on chairs that was unknown back then. It was more like a small coffee table and very low. And you would lay on the ground prone, facing the inside of the table. Your left wrist, your left elbow was sitting on a cushion and you use your right hand to, to get things from the table. So the disciples were sit, seated in this way. In the center of the room, there's a lamp, just one light source. And he was experimenting with that, just one light source, the way it would hit people's faces but there is one disciple leaving and that disciple is the one that looks like jesus and in his hand is a, a bag of money now judas did not betray jesus but that's the way he identified him the only way he could have identified him identified him also i want you to look for uh, leonardo's paintings try and find some work of his before they went and fixed it up remember they were going to re um and touch it up, uh, the Last Supper. Because in that one, the guy who's supposed to be Judas, the one holding the bag, again, I told you Judas is sitting to the left, that's the left side of Jesus. He's the one that looks like, um, like Jesus. Yeah. Mary Magdalene is definitely sitting to the right side of Jesus. If you take that face, the exact face of that person, superimpose it on the Madonna of the rocks, it is the exact same face. And then people say, oh, well, Men were often painted like women back then, especially young men like John. But there is another individual in the picture who doesn't wear a beard. That's John. He's um, wearing green. He's on the right side over there. But over the guy who's got his hand to her throat, that they say that's Peter's an old man. But he's got his right hand behind him, coming up behind him. Um, I want to say in a weird kind of Egyptian pose, like he's walking. And then you have another hand coming out with a knife. That is not that man's hand. 
it's a brown sleeve, he's wearing blue. Also, that the way that hand is positioned, you'd have to break your, your arm about halfway between the elbow and the wrist and then twist it outward and back to hold that knife like that. And some would think, well, it's, Leonardo made a mistake, but Leonardo was famous for not making that mistake. That is the disciple that's missing. There are 13 men in that room, and there's a woman. That one man holding the knife, that was the disciple who was murdered. He was uh, martyred, I guess. He was the first one martyred. He's not even mentioned among the disciples. His name was Stephen, and Paul was responsible for killing him. Now, right in that location, a lot of stuff is happening where that knife is. You see that one disciple, he's got both his hands up. Yeah, I'll zoom in on that, the one on the left. He's got both his hands up and he's looking straight out. Now, the one with the money bag, Jewish, yeah, that one. Okay, zoom in a little closer. This is one that I think they touched up. But go ahead and zoom in on the guy wearing blue and white. Yeah. Yes. He's got the bag in his hand. Yeah, that's... Just... Okay, yeah, they, that's, that's definitely another... That's not the actual... That's touched up quite a bit. Right where his neck is, he's got his cloak is kind of pulled down considerably and it's there's actually a baby in swaddling clothes there and that guy who's who's seated to the left there with his hands up that's not where he's at somebody modified this picture so this is not the picture that guy's standing up he's looking directly into the baby's eyes and both his hands are visible the hand that's holding the knife that's not the hand of this uh, this guy there with his wrist but they also touched that one up as well anyway the guy with the green on the right side of Jesus that is the uh, twin who had been Judas Iscariot. They were separated at birth. There is an author out there who wrote a story similar to my story, and she also mentions Jesus and Judas were twins, identical twins separated at birth. And um, her book is called The Moon Beneath Her Feet. I don't remember the, her name right now. I do mention her in the book. But I read her book, and it was fascinating, and she got her research from the the Quran. The Quran speaks of Judas looking so much like Jesus in mannerism and talk and speech. And then there were several other gospels, one's called the Gospel of Barnabas, speaking of how Judas looked uh, very much like Jesus, like an identical twin. And the name Thomas, the disciple Thomas, there is no disciple Thomas. That is a nickname that was applied to Judas. It means the twin, the lookalike, the double. Didymus means double. Well, the, well, when I was, I've heard a lot about this painting in, in, in general, like about that, like, I know that you can tell this isn't the original, so I'll have to pull up another one. Mm-hmm. It was talking about, essentially, you can take a, the sun, right? And then you can make um, this, the 12 constellations of the zodiac, you know, left to right, things like that. And it was kind of like a subliminal message through that as well. Um, also, look at the tablecloth. Right, right where you have that white, the blue circle at the bottom where like a pen is. It looks like there's a knot in the napkin there at the end, but there is no knot in that napkin. There is one to the right, a knot in a painting by a painter of that time was the code that Mary Magdalene was in the painting. Mm-hmm. But there's only one knot. And in the actual painting, the one on the left is not tied into a knot. The one on the right is. See if I can pull this one up. <laughs> this one looks a little. Mm, that looks even different. No, same, same thing. Got the knots in there. Um, go back out and go to the first one on the left. Is that the one you got? You looked older. That one. This one looks. Yeah, this one looks a lot different. Okay, that's the original. There's a doorway. This is the original. Okay, so you've got Judas on the right there. Go to the left where the woman is, to her face. Okay, stop right there. You've got, you had your pointer on the baby's head. You see where Judas's head is? And right below it, you got a tuft of brown hair. That's the baby. There's his ear. And the entire sleeve is the baby's bundled up. The guy with his hands up, his eyes looking directly into the baby's eyes. When yeah. you when you zoom in, you'll see it. I can kind of see what you're saying. It looks like they're they're looking right down at it there. You know, around that. No, 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 no. It's further to the left. Further to the, left. the guy with holding the the bag. Yeah. That, okay, he's holding the bag. His arm go right to his face. Go right where his face and his beard are. Where his ear is. Yeah. Put it on his ear. 
the head of the baby is directly below that. Okay. And the bloodline came from Judas. The bloodline of Judas had to marry Mary Magdala and give her a child. The child would be called the child of the first brother. Remember, they had this custom. And so the bloodline is from the same, the same bloodline. It just comes from Judas, not Jesus. So are you saying this, that maybe this hand right here was like um, going to this guy originally and they just kind of edited? Like No, no, there's another person behind there. That, that hand is, belongs to somebody else completely. Yeah. And it, uh, it's a disciple that was killed, Stefan. Yeah, I can see. I can see why it looks kind of unnatural and it looks like they almost... It looks yeah, like zoom in more right in that one area if you can. I don't think it's letting me anymore. Okay. I think that's as far as it's letting me go. I guess that's the pixelation of it. I might be able okay. to. Okay. It's cool. Man. If you go to, um, that's, a, that's the one, the one where it's at the actual doorway. You can see the doorway down here. Go to uh, Nicholas Poussin Eucharist, and you'll see the painting I'm talking about, That what the Last Supper actually looked like. And Nicholas it has no H in it or K. It's N-I-C-O-L-A-S. Poussin, P-O-U-S-S-I-N, and Eucharist, E-U-C-H-A-R-I-S-T. It's a series of seven paintings. Did I get it again? What is it? E uh... It's um, E-U-C-H-A-R-I-S-T. I-S-T. Uh, India, Sierra, Sierra Tango. That's the painting. So go ahead and click on the first one. It's a low table. They're all on the floor. And Jesus is seated to the back. And the guy walking out the door, he looks the same as Jesus, has the same hair and the same beard. He's in some, a few other paintings. You can't miss him. And he's got a bag in yeah, his hand as he's walking out the door. Yeah, I can see exactly what you're saying. That's pretty cool. Like the Da Vinci Code almost other painters you know that was uh, not just hidden in his work almost yeah that's really interesting okay there's a twin jesus is always wearing white but the twin was wearing that um that other color um Okay, he's the twin is wearing the orangish color to the left of Jesus, yeah. right there. And then there's uh, one where he's giving the keys of the kingdom to Peter, but Jesus is in the background preaching, so it's actually the Judas character giving the keys to the kingdom to Peter, meaning he never gave them to the Roman Catholic Church. Let's see if I can pull a couple more. Oh, I guess that's a tiny one. Yeah, there's a series of seven. You can find them later. That one, I think, is called The Ordination, the one where he's being given the keys. But um, I guess that'll pretty much do it. The whole point of his resurrecting was to give us an example that our bodies can become light bodies. When the shockwave arrives, it's going to um, basically change the planet change everything. But before that happens, I mentioned earlier about the Eucharist, I mean the Eucharist, the RV. You remember, have you heard of the RV? What's happening is the dinar, the, I'm not sure about the Vietnamese, Vietnamese one, but a Zim, Zim notes. I've been hearing that those are going to be revalued, that they've been purchased by China with gold. The gold is not really, most of it's not from this world. That money, which is basically worthless, not Confederate money, is actually going to be revalued. And the individuals who have it have it because they're going to be doing humanitarian projects all over the world. And um, when they're funded, if it ever comes to pass, when they're funded, it sort of shows the off-worlders, hey, the humans really do care about their planet. They really do care about each other. It was their governments or people in control, the ones who always kept control and their boot on their neck that were running. And they come and call. Oh. You're fine. I can pause it for a second. It happens. That means that 
um, the the landings won't be far behind. And the United States, you're, you're familiar that the United States was basically hijacked and we have been a corporation for quite a, forever, actually. Yeah. Okay, that's been, that's been undone. We are now the Republic again. And the president will be releasing a new money called USN, US Note, their rainbow money, and they're backed by gold. And basically, the corporation that was a U.S. is the one that's going to be owing the Federal Reserves the, uh, yes, all the money they borrowed. Because the Republic is not, the IRS will have to give back all the money that they've ever taken since they did it illegally. They were never ratified. And there's going to be a, a flat tax. So anyway, all this is supposed to be taking place soon if these guys ever get their act together. They've been doing some amazing things. There's some amazing battles taking place right now. A lot of these underground bunkers are at war and burning at this moment because the Marines and um, several other units from off-world are actually invading and attacking and taking these people prisoners. They've already begun arresting the pedophiles, the lower hanging fruit. And with their... Um, Testimony, they'll be indicting the other ones, and there'll be a tremendous amount of arrests taking place. I believe they're going to put them in the, the re-education camps that were created for us under FEMA that uh, I'm not sure yet. I've heard some of them are just being eliminated. So that's some of the stuff behind the scenes that I'm involved with, and um, I hope they pull it off pretty soon, because once they do, you will not recognize this planet. One of the things I want to go after is um, that virus they created. It was a bacteria to eat the oil back when um, they had that disaster in the Gulf. Yeah. This company created this bacteria. They did not create a back door, as far as I know, to get in there and destroy it. They, they thought they had it made. And the Hopi prophesied about this. This is one of the prophecies. If you go to the Acolytes Quill, it's under Hopi prophecy. It's about 30 minutes from the most amazing talks I've ever heard of this guy giving some of the most detailed prophecies of the Hopi and what this was all about. Yeah. And he says that in the end of days, men will be wanting to be women and women will be wanting to be turned to men yeah. and that men would create synthetic organisms and release them with horrific consequences. This is one of them. This thing was called Cynthia. It was released to eat the oil. It did a great job and then it mutated into a flesh eating bacteria do not touch any tar balls if you're down by the coast. If this thing gets on you, they pretty much have to hack off the uh, limb to save you. And uh, it's spreading all over the world, and there's nothing to stop it. So they need to get a grip on that thing and, and stop it before it wipes out the world. That's why Bill Gates says in 100 years there'll be no life on the planet. That's, that's one of the reasons. Yeah, they, they did some pretty detailed projections, and the world just looks like a scab here in like 80 years. There's no more green. <laughs> so they have to come out. It's almost like they got to, they have to, there has to be some kind of change. Something has to be interceding or changing. Um, when you look up the, the root of the word apocalypse, it just means the unveiling, like, like full dis right. disclosure, man. That's what full, it means. Full disclosure. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it means. Well, full disclosure deals with pedophiles and they don't want that they don't want full disclosure they just want to put us in a bigger box with partial disclosure yeah halfway and i'm 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 happy with that i mean we're always going to be mad and say no we want full but i mean hey steps right steps when anytime you take mm -hmm. a big leap forward takes a couple steps backwards and people don't realize that you can't just take like a leap of faith in the sense that if it's everybody's safety and the change of like collapse of money systems and things like that it is a very ginger type thing that you have to they have to be careful they can't just yank the money without preparing us first you know or doing some kind of tra transitionary acts which in which people don't get left behind or you know people can't get food or this and that and you know just simple things you know so i'm sure it's a lot of work involved because I mean, our world's messed up right now, and it definitely needs change. But I, I you recall have, how have hope for well, President Trump just released that thing where he wanted to <laughs> rebuild America with that trillion dollar, um, I guess, a bill that he has out there to rebuild the infrastructure where the federal government would take care of the bridges. The larger stuff on the interstate highways, the states would take care of the smaller stuff, but they would, they would supply jobs in those areas where they're doing that. And some of the money would be coming from the private sector. 
this is the private sector he's talking about. These people are going to have a tremendous amount of money, and they've already um, basically taken over what they're going to do is, is take over their communities in a way, not take over them, but fix everything that's wrong with the houses, fix everything that's wrong with the plumbing, because these, this money is it's pretty much going to be almost unlimitless for them. It doesn't really matter because in about a year and a half to two years, there will be no more money on the planet. You won't really need it. If you finally get you to understand that whatever it is you want to accomplish because you have an idea to accomplish it, they will give you all the resources you need. That's how it's done in every other world. The only problem is nobody has any ideas because they're not human. Their minds don't work the way our minds work. Yeah. I think that has to do with like um, even like why the politicians and some of these people get picked. It's almost like, all right, in their human form, they're already willing to the how they rise to power is they're already willing and stoop to the levels that other humans wouldn't do and crossing moral standpoints that most humans couldn't do. So they get to that point and it probably already makes them more susceptible or more compatible with those creatures because their aura is not as powerful you know just just balance like the, the spirit right but once the um once the constitution is reenacted most of the congressmen that are there will no longer be congressmen simply because of the 13th amendment which states anyone who is barred meaning a lawyer and some doctors they will not be able to hold an office political office yeah that's pretty much all of them Hmm. Okay, well, I guess that pretty much sums up the Wraps stuff we, it up. we're going to cover tonight. All right. Yeah, I, I, I had a good talk, and I'm glad you were on. Um, I'm going to leave links for your book again and get that out there because uh, you obviously worked really hard, and I know it'll click and help somebody on their journey somewhere, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, I appreciate you taking your time out and uh, – you know, getting on these small time channels and things like that. We're growing. We're almost up to a thousand viewers. So that's pretty good for a year, I think. And uh, glad to see you on the, the leak project and all that. So yeah, just stay in touch and thank. It's been great. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me and having me on. And um, I love the work you're doing. You're on the right path. Their prophecy is coming to fruition it's just not going to happen exactly the way they saw it because we're on a different timeline but the outer events the bigger events like september 23rd that sort of stuff the eclipse is happening those are major cosmic events doesn't matter what timeline you're on they're going to happen yeah they're like the, the planet's revolving and things like that you can't it's uh it's a bigger clock you know <laughs> yeah